Hello, valued viewers. I hope you're all doing very well. And just a gentle reminder that the Super Thanks button is on. It is located on the taskbar near the Like button. Simply contribute $20 or more toward the channel's effort and get a video of your choice topic done as the next available project. Simply make the contribution and go to the comment section and describe your topic. And I do it just as soon as I possibly can. And also, any contribution, $1, $2, is greatly appreciated and will get you ag acknowledged on my next uh, video. And finally, don't forget to ask your questions in any of the comment sections of my videos. I will acknowledge seeing the question and include it on my Every Monday Q&A video. And now, on to the video. The 2666 Allegheny is certainly one of the largest ever to hit the railways. Whether we're talking about today's diesels or yesterday's steam locomotives, it's towering height, it's immense weight, and the way that it made the ground shake as it approached and passed you by, it simply left people in awe of its mechanical marvel. But what was the, the true origin of this fantastic locomotive, and what new innovations made it possible? Let's find that out. So let's take a seat and enjoy the ride. Up until the 1920s, the Lima Locomotive Works was known for the hugely successful and very popular Shea geared locomotives. But the, everything else was standard issue or nothing unusual and sometimes just not good. To return to the forefront as a locomotive builder, Lima mechanical engineer William E. Woodard developed his conceptual ideas of the term superpower. Woodard changed several existing engineering and design practices to maximize the steam locomotive's ability to generate and use steam. By utilizing his proposed changes, Woodard could make locomotives substantially more powerful and faster. Starting in 1922, he began his quest and did just that. Woodard started with the H-10 Experimental Heavy 282 Mikado design for both the New York Central and the Michigan Central, and applying both relatively new science, specifically coal ratios, and every efficiency-enhancing tool available, such as a larger firebox, increased superheat, a feed water heater, and improved droughting for in higher boiler pressure, streamlined steam passages, and a trailing truck booster engine. And by applying limited cutoff, which is the range of steam valve admission settings, that prevented locomotive engineers from using excessive steam at starting. The 282 thus demonstrated a 26% more efficient overall return than its immediate predecessor, and the New York Central bought 301 copies of these enhanced Mikados. So now, being very pleased with the results of the H10 Mikado des uh, design and changes that he implemented, Woodard wants to increase the firebox area from 66 square feet to 100 square feet in his next and upcoming design. And with this particular modification, what Woodard immediately found out was that he needed to add another axle to the trailing truck, and that created the 284 wheel arrangement. Built in the spring of 1925, the first Berkshire 284, which was a demonstrator owned by Lima, was dubbed the A1. In addition to supporting the very large firebox and grate, the four-wheel trailing truck carried the ash pan. For this purpose, the truck was redesigned as an articulated extension of the locomotive frame. The result was an ash pan which could hold more ash, allowing the locomotive to travel farther between cleanings. And quickly, this A1 design quickly proved to be a whopping 30% more efficient than the previous New York Central H10 Mikado design. After a highly successful series of tests in the mid-1920s, it was sent around the country to make the idea of superpower known. The first 45 were purchased by the New York Central subsidiary Boston and Albany following initial road testing across the summit of Berkshire Hills. And so the 284 wheel ratio simply came to be known as Berkshire. Woodard summed up superpower by defining it as horsepower at speed. Previous design principles emphasized tractive effort, which is the pulling ability of a locomotive, rather than speed. By 1949, some 613 Berkshires had been constructed for North America service, of which 20 are preserved. And that made the Berkshire one of the most successful locomotives ever built on American railways. There were at least three successful waves of superpower. The first, of course, began with the New York Central's 8000 H10s and then followed by the A1 original Berkshire design, which also included the Missouri Pacific 284 and also the Texas and Pacific's uh, follow-up design of the 210 fours. 
These locomotives had conventional 63-inch driving wheels, and in 1927, the Erie Railroad took delivery of a second-phase Berkshire with 70-inch driver wheels, capable of not only of great power, but higher speed. In turn, this design evolved into the Chesapeake Peaks and Ohio T1 210-4s of 1930, with 69-inch driving wheels. The third phase of the later 1930s and war years can be identified with locomotives such as virtually all American 484 locomotives. Boiler pressures rose as high as 310 pounds per square inch, and thermic siphons were added to the firebox and combustion chamber, and those added 8% to the boiler efficiency. Timken roller bearings appeared on main axle boxes and sometimes even the running gear, and the superpower concept had extended to other builders such as Elko with the Union Pacific Big Boy and Baldwin with the Santa Fe 5001 and 5011 class of 210-4s. The four-wheel trailing truck be became standard for large locomotives such as the 484s, though the articulated mainframe did not. Many railroads particularly roads like the Santa Fe, which favored oil-burning locomotives and therefore did not need the oversized ash pan, adopted many of the superpower features, but utilized a conventional full frame and separate trailing truck and not articulation. But this was not true of the Chesapeake and Ohio, who designed and built through Lima what many considered to be the pinnacle of all steam locomotives, and that was the 2666 Allegheny. And this locomotive was made possible by all of Woodward's superpower concepts, as well as the Timken roller bearings. One of the frequent questions asked is, why did the Chesapeake and Ohio need the Alleghenies? And the answer is a relatively simple to uh, the fact that they needed to haul massive heavy coal trains over the steep mountainous grades of the West Virginia, uh, especially in the profitable Allegheny subdivision. The Alleghenies uh, basically had the immense horsepower and tractive effort needed to move thousands of tons of coal efficiently, efficiently and they were replacing older engines such as the uh, 2104 Texas type uh, locomotives and allowing faster, more profitable movement of America's most vital wartime and post-war fuel supply. Another frequent question asked of me regarding the Allegheny is why did it only have a two-wheeled lead truck? And there's a simple answer to that, and that's because of the world record size firebox was entirely placed on the back six wheel support. And adding more lead wheels like four would make the engine too long, upset the balance of the locomotive on the curves, and likely exceed turntable limits, making the two-wheel pilot sufficient for guidance while prioritizing firebox size and articulation for power. Okay, so a quick recap in the Chesapeake and Ohio's concept design ideas for the Allegheny. And the first and foremost uh, thing was it needed a direct replacement for the 2104 Texas type locomotives that had been doing the coal drags. The Allegheny could simply haul a lot more in one go, and it was also faster in doing so. And then there was the Lima breakthrough with a record uh, setting size of the firebox that required it to be uh, positioned over a six wheel trailing truck, which was the unique design feature to the Allegheny. And lastly, there was Woodard super uh, power technology. And this was the pinnacle of Lima's superpower concept, emphasizing, emphasizing horsepower and speed. It features 67-inch driving wheels for speed and a massive boiler with a 260 PSI pressure. Some other technical specifications regarding the Allegheny was the horsepower was rated at a peak of 7,500, making it one of the most powerful reciprocating steam locomotives ever built, and it surpassed the Union Pacific's Big Boy's 6,300 horsepower by comparison. The weight of the locomotive was arguably the heaviest steam locomotive in the world. The engine alone weighed roughly 778,000 pounds, and that exceeded the initial design specs of the 724,500 pounds. The tender was to fit on 115 foot turntables and the tender was designed with a unique six wheel front truck and a four wheel rear truck carrying 25,000 gallons of water and 25 tons of coal. The Allegheny caused the Chesapeake and Ohio some serious maintenance challenges as well. And the first thing was that the locomotive had the highest axle load of any steam locomotive ever built with over 80,000 pounds and some sources cite up to 86,700 pounds. And that was on the main driving axle. This immense weight demanded that only railroads with their most robust, heaviest of gauge of tracks could safely operate the Allegheny. It also required constant track maintenance. We has the weight stress the track infrastructure requiring ongoing maintenance to manually straighten rails back into alignment. There's also bridge limitations with the locomotive's weight restricted it to operating territory to lines with bridges certified to handle such heavy loads. 
And then neighboring railroads were reluctant to allow the heavy Alleghenies on their lines due to the concerns about their own track and bridge capacity. The sheer size of the locomotive made standard maintenance procedures difficult. It, with the turntables, the locomotive and its large specialized tender were designed to fit on existing 115-foot tables, but this was a tight fit and a limiting factor in design and operation. The shop limitations, uh, because of the size and weight, also posed challenges within maintenance shops, as demonstrated by the difficulty in moving a preserved example into a museum building, such as the Henry Ford Museum. And lastly, there's some operational suitability issues, because while powerful, the Alleghenies are often operated in the slow-speed cold drag service, and that's an application, the design of which everyone agreed upon was not really suited for uh, in the end. Uh, the Alleghenies were designed for high horsepower, fast freight more so, and operating below their peak efficiency range potentially added to operational stress and wear and tear on the locomotives themselves, so they were not probably the most re mechanically reliable in the end. An interesting design note is that when the Chesapeake and Ohio set out to build a more powerful engine than the Allegheny, it was the goal of the Chesapeake and Ohio to not outperform the Union Pacific's big boy, but instead the hope was to outclass the Norfolk and Western's Class A's 2664's locomotives. And it wound up in the end, of course, outperforming everybody. And probably one of the biggest criticisms on the Alleghenies is simply the fact that they were never used as intended or as built. And that was with the fast freight services. So the question of cost versus what they actually got out of the locomotives is highly in question. And many people doubt whether or not they were actually ever worth building in the end. But one thing is for certain with the Alleghenies, the Chesapeake and Ohio created one of the most beloved locomotives uh, for us rail fans to enjoy. The big boy locomotives definitely got a lot more notoriety over history, but the 2666 Alleghenies were more powerful and are often credited as the pinnacle of superpower steam technology. And sadly, these locomotives were practically new when they were retired. The oldest locomotive barely were 10 years old before the Chesapeake and Ohio began retiring their fleet in 1952.